So Warhammer 40k Space Marine 2 just came out and I was super excited to play this, but I actually didn't know much prior to playing it. All I knew is that this was a huge universe that was complicated, expensive and very detailed. I went into this pretty much blind, had not done any prior research and was looking forward to the experience since all of the talk around social media had been so positive. I will warn you, my analysis and review of the game goes through everything. From every single aspect of the missions, plot points, game mechanics, absolutely everything. So if you don't want to be spoiled, you've been warned. The first thing I notice is how the main menu only has the options of continue, new game, options and quit. For such a long time I've been used to games bombarding me with new DLC news and their new offers that I actually missed having a simple and straight to the chase main menu that only wants you to play the game and doesn't preoccupy itself with getting you to buy a whole lot more crap before you even start the game or know what it is about. Also the music is badass. When you start the game, it plays an amazingly beautiful rendered cutscene that sets the tone for what the game actually is. A beautiful, gory and violent experience. When the gameplay actually starts, they slowly introduce you to the controls and the UI, but first and foremost, the UI is not overwhelming, allowing you to showcase the actual beauty of the environments first and concerning the player with learning what the interface means and the controls as they go along. But we gotta talk about the controls. In all honesty, what you're seeing on screen probably looks a lot more clunky than it actually feels because the characters are kind of slow and bulky. But actually, the character controls are buttery smooth and the way it looks on video is far from how good it actually feels to play as Titus. What's hard to master is the unconventional controls and type of gameplay. Keep in mind I played on PC, the controls have a slight learning curve because both melee and weapons are the primary forms of attacking and defending yourself. And you only have two mechanics which are defensive, which is your parry, guard, key and dodging. The rest of your defensive tactics will come in the form of offensive gameplay since this game has a similar system to Bloodborne, where you heal when you attack after losing health. If you try to run away from your enemies, you'll very quickly die because you're not supposed to. The very nature of your character is to hold no fear in the face of death, and so should you. To me, a good tutorial can at times either make or break a game. In Warhammer, there's a little but very short-lived hand-holding that lasts about 5 minutes. After that, very quickly you're expected to master the controls and handle yourself in a fight with what you've learned. I'm ashamed to say it, but I did die once in the tutorial. Which is good, it shattered the expectation that carries on from other games, expectations that I'm going to win for the first hour of the game and only then will challenge present itself to me as the player. Not at all, 15 to 20 minutes in, you're on your own kid. Now, I'm not going to talk much on multiplayer, but a disclaimer to manage your expectations. Multiplayer game modes like PvE and PvP only become available after you finish the tutorial, which in my opinion is actually a good call. It makes you engage with the efforts they put into the actual plot of the main game. Why is this smart? It prevents what Call of Duty has suffered for decades. People only interested in playing the game for its multiplayer and possibly never setting their eyes on the story and the world the game is supposed to be set in the first place. In a way, it displays respect for all aspects of the game and doesn't clearly emphasize what the developers and even the publishers value most about the game. Yes, it may be that the multiplayer options is what keeps the game alive in the long run, but that doesn't mean that the main story section of the game deserves any less recognition. Now, there's three types of game modes. Annihilation, which is team deathmatch until you get to 50 kills. Capture and control, this is the equivalent to domination. And seize ground, this is like hardpoint, one control area pops up in a random part of the map and both teams fight to control it until it disappears and shows up at a different random side of the map. There are only three maps, which is a bit underwhelming, but in all honesty, even though the quantity of the maps is a bit lackluster, the quality of the maps takes a crown. They're unique, fun and allow for a lot of experimentation with the different classes. There's also several types of classes which are pretty straightforward, from your usual bulky tank, dexterous DPS and sneaky sniper. Personally, I main the sniper class as I tried playing one of the more melee focused classes and the verdict is that I suck at them, so I stick to what I do best. Honestly, I really like the multiplayer. It's simple, it's not super fancy and it works. The maps really remind me of Quake and that in itself is a big compliment. There's also customization which you can earn for each individual class as you gain more and more proficiency by playing each of them. So even though you could get cosmetics through the season pass, you can still earn free goodies through actually playing the game, which to me is a win. Also to touch on co-op, this is my least explored part of the game so far. I've only played the first mission, but I'll brush through it just a little bit. 
Besides the original game, you can also play the co-op missions which are named Operations. The missions themselves comprise of you and two other squad mates, exactly the same as the original game. These missions, I believe for the most part, take place in tandem with the main story. So for example, if in the main story we're playing as Titus, but there are other squads in the narrative completing different objectives, supposedly in tandem to our gameplay, these are the co-op missions. At least so far. I believe all of them are just a little branching storyline that happens at the same time as the original plot. In all honesty, I like that. It's a creative way of having people play an online portion of the game, but somehow still having it relate to the main story, which can kill two birds with one stone. And at least it does that for me. I like playing online shooters and also like to play the single player campaign, so the structure of the co-op is very much made for someone like me. I can't speak much more on it since I've explored it for such a small amount of time, but from what I've experienced, it's pretty good and I'd say it's worth trying. But back to the story. After the tutorial boss, we wake up somewhere to a chaplain speaking to us and letting us know what has happened. The wound we had suffered was fatal, but after rescuing us, they performed the Rubicon surgery, which is a very long story, but essentially, it's a gruesome procedure where they literally cut you up from your feet to the top of your head. It's supposed to come with some enhancements, but as a wise man once said, without pain, there's no gain. We're now a Primaris Marine, which means that we no longer belong to the Death Watch branch of Ultramarines. It seems as if we're returning to this branch after being punished for some previous actions. You'll have to play the first game of the franchise to get more context, but if you play the rest of this one, you'll get the gist of the story anyways. We meet with Acheron, which is our new captain. He lets us know that we have been demoted since we last belonged to the ranks. We're a lieutenant now instead, but we still have command over a team of two other Ultramarines. But now, time for our first mission. We're to head down to Kadaku once more. This time, we're protecting massive weapons that keep the skies clear for our ships to arrive and evacuate any remaining troops or people who we're responsible for getting out of the planet. We officially meet our two squad mates on our way down to the ship, Chiron and Gadriel. These will be with us for the rest of the story. Upon arrival at Kadaku, we meet up with the Astra Militarum, who proceed to brief us on the situation. We advance with them towards the battlefield and attempt to clear a path through their attack so that we can move towards the guns we're intending to protect. Soon after being able to pierce through enemy lines, we make our way through the swamp where we meet more and more enemies on the way. We come across a bunch of Kidian troops who have trapped Tyranids inside the facility. We request the gates to open as it is the only way for us to move forward. As they open, we get swarmed by Tyranids on the outside. I guess we're not safe anywhere in this universe. As we're about to be overwhelmed, the gates finish opening and we make our way inside the facility in order to escape. As we navigate through the facility, we meet the remaining of the Tyranids who have made themselves comfortable and at home. As expected, we don't allow for that to be the case for very long. But the facility is just a path towards the more significant goal, which is to make it to the base where the guns we need to protect are located at. Before we move on to the base, we rendezvous with Captain Aiden, who supports us in making a way through to the base while using tanks and his troops. When we make it through to safety, the Cadians start to turn on the guns that are supposed to take down the Tyranid ships. By the way, these guns are freaking huge. Titus warns the Cadians to not underestimate the enemy, since Tyranids possess hive minds, which means it's as if they all have one collective consciousness, which allow them to catch onto our plans quite easily. Which they unfortunately do. As we make our way up to the satellite dish to turn on the targeting system, the Tyranids catch onto our plans and attempt to overwhelm us. Of course this fails and we're able to turn on all the mechanisms which raise all of the four pedals of the satellite dish, but the Tyranid gargoyles then change their tactic. They then move on to attacking the antennas so they can break the dish completely. Our job here is to literally shoot them off the antennas until there's none of them wreaking havoc anymore. We proceed to do that too, which I'm not gonna lie, was actually a bit difficult, but a very pleasant way to start introducing more and more challenging encounters, even if it's not by means of having a traditional boss fight. We succeed in our objective and the guns are able to defend the planet and shoot down the enemy airship with a magnificent explosion. We then return to our battle barge. For the second mission, we're actually tasked with going back to Karaku, but this time, we're to recover some research from a lab. Well, technically, we're there to exfiltrate Archmago's Nozick Beta 12, this guy. He's not the nicest looking person, and he's kind of a dick too. The tricky thing is, he doesn't want to leave the planet until we're actually able to recover data from his laboratory. But what's the catch? As expected, it's overrun with Tyranids of all kinds. We make our way through a forest, finding small hordes here and there, but we start noticing that something is following us, or better yet, hunting us. We proceed through some more of these woods, the very thing that's been hunting us decides to make themselves known. We're being attacked by a Lictor. 
which is a pretty looking dude that likes to pop in and out of invisibility. This is the first boss fight of the game. It's not too hard, but as I was still getting used to the mechanics of dodging and parrying, which I'm not gonna lie, I tend to get confused between the two. As you can expect, it's not only just us versus the Lictor, other less meaningful Tyranids join the fight just to make matters harder. Once it's dead, we finally get to the monumental lab that we're supposed to recover the research from. Once we make it to the lab, we've got to make our way down it. What's expecting us? Well, take a wild guess. In this part of the game, a new enemy gets introduced. The Rippers. They basically attack in swarms and there's only one effective weapon against them. Fire. I have to say, at this point in the game, this was probably the most annoying enemy. I'm not sure if that's a bad thing or a good thing. Honestly, mixing these Rippers with the rest of the Tyranids in a combat sequence made it feel more frustrating rather than simply a harder section of the game. Using a weapon that is effective against Rippers but then noticeably less so against all others, forcing you to use your sword but then exposing you to attacks from Rippers, I get it. It was supposed to be hard and I appreciate it, but maybe I just didn't enjoy the approach that was taken in just this particular part. At last, we find ourselves in the lowest level of the lab, which is of course where we needed to go. Here we have to turn on two generators, which will allow the Archmagus to recover his work, and then proceeding to let him exfil. But it's not that simple. As we turn on the generators, they need to power up. While that happens, we're supposed to defend it from all threats, which is more rippers and regular tyranids. It's a lengthy section, but we get it done and hopefully the Archmagos can actually leave the planet and stop insulting us as we're actually trying to help him. But the ship he boards crashes as fast as it took off, so now it turns into a rescue mission. At this stage, a new mechanic gets introduced in the game, the jetpack. For such a heavy dude that we're playing, the jetpack makes you feel damn mobile. It's a welcome change of pace as it adds a whole lot of mobility but also presents the game with verticality, which throws us off considering that the game has been quite linear so far. But I digress. As we move towards the crash site, a little section happens, which is essentially a bit of a tutorial for the jetpack. As we fight through another horde of enemies, we're to set several charges of explosives which clear a path towards where the ship fell. We arrive at the crash and everyone's dead especially our beloved Archmagus. But something strange happens. An object inside what remains of the ship calls to Titus and makes him feel weak. We board a ship with that same object and we go unconscious. As we regain our consciousness, our squad is worried that we might falter again during a mission which could put them at risk. Titus doesn't believe so because he's a hard motherfucker. Nevertheless, we are to run the diagnostic to see if there are any issues with Titus relating to the Rubicon surgery we underwent earlier in the story. Surprisingly, nothing comes up so we're deemed fit for battle and we must get back into action. Our mission is now to make our way down to a new planet in the story, Avarax. Here we're to access a cogitator which can let us locate the assistant of the Archmagos that got killed in the previous mission, Mariah's Luz. The reason why this man is important is because he's the only person with the knowledge to possibly continue Project Aurora. I've gotta say, this location is absolutely gorgeous. It looks like a mix between the royal capital in Elden Ring and steampunk art. Its sheer hugeness and detail is just incredible. As expected, we're not here on our own. We always have the company of our trusty Tyranids, which have swarmed the place and made themselves feel at home. Now, as we arrive, we notice that we can't cross the bridge just yet, as the elevator is on the other side and has no power. So we've got to make our way to a console to get it back up and running and down to us before we can actually get to where we need to be to locate the target. Getting to the console is fairly easy. Just a couple of groups of enemies here and there. Once we get to the console and restore power, the elevator makes its way down to us, and then we make our way down to it. And now we have a little fun section. We make it to the elevator and we start going up, but while that happens, gargoyles make an appearance and try to chew on the chains of the elevator so that, well, we die. So our goal here is to essentially make sure that the chains last until we make it up and survive all the ambushes they have in store for us. I actually like this type of encounter. For me, this is what I mean by fun difficulty, while the encounter with the Rippers just felt a bit much and obnoxious. So we make it through to the other side, but we still have to find the cogitator, and again, we go down. I like how at this stage, similar to how it happened in the lab in the previous mission, when we're not engaging in battle, there's a lot of ambiance and tension building. Meaning that although we're more relaxed than when fighting, we can never really afford to fully relax. I like that, it's a nice detail that can be easily overlooked. We get to a point where a system needs to be reset in order to unlock a door. When that happens, the room goes completely dark, and we know that's no good. We get swarmed fast by both regular Tyranids and a Lictor, 
but luckily for me, I picked up a pyre blaster and said, let there be light. I burned through dozens if not hundreds of enemies. It's not too difficult of a section, but at this stage it became my favorite part of the game since the environment itself was used against me. We as the player got used to being able to see the enemy and even at times preemptively attacking them as they make our way to us. But that got completely flipped on us when we couldn't see the enemy at all, but still had to unfuck ourselves out of that situation. Now that we can breathe, we get on an elevator that takes us up to a nice looking room. The thing with nice looking rooms is that they quickly turn into battle arenas for a boss battle. And that's exactly what we have. In this case, we're fighting a Carnifex, which is exactly the same creature that nearly killed us in the tutorial mission. It's a tough fight, but an enjoyable one. But since I had already learned its attack patterns from the first fight we had, I didn't find it too challenging, so I killed it. Poetically. As we're nearing the Cogitator, we come across a Volkite reactor, which essentially generates a type of energy used in weaponry. We finally find the Cogitator and find the location of Marias, as we were tasked to do, but Titus starts looking into Project Aurora, which catches his squadmates by surprise considering its confidential information we're not supposed to have access to. Before we're able to look into it any further, the Tyranids start throwing themselves at the reactor, meaning that its meltdown could be imminent if you don't do something about it. So we do something about it. Here we fight three waves of enemies while protecting the reactor from getting overrun with our enemies. We do that in three parts, as we need to disengage the pylons from being connected to the reactor. We do this successfully and we move to the next part of the mission. When we arrive back, we speak to Acheron. Titus confronts him about what he found within the files he snooped about Project Aurora. This is where playing the first game probably would have had a good amount of context because I'm not sure why he's so upset at the fact that this artifact is being used. Apart from the fact that it has a dangerous sounding name, Fragment of the Dark God's Power. After Acheron gives us a scolding about meddling in business we shouldn't, we get back in our ship and move now to actually rescue Mariah's Luz. As we approach the landing zone, we get attacked in midair and crash. Are you keeping count? There's a lot of crashing in this game. Anyway, we have to make our way to a temple which is surrounded by enemies, break through their line of defenses, and finally rescue Mariah's, God willing. As we step out of the shipwreck, we need to start heading to the dome while fighting enemies on the way. As we make our way, we cross paths with the Astra Militarum and help them fight some waves of enemies. Once it's safe, one of the members of our squad, Chiron, recognizes one of the Astartes by the name of Varelis. They essentially know each other because Varelis saved Chiron's life at some point in the past, creating a brotherhood between the two. Varelis mentions that there is a Neurothrope nearby which has basically halted them and killed the rest of the team. We decided to head that way and deal with the threat. At this stage, Gadriel, the other one of our squadmates, starts doing something I quite like as a tool of developing the plot and actually breathing some life into these companions of ours. Titus's behavior has been a bit erratic, questions orders from a superior, digging into classified files, and although he behaves as if he fears and actions are justified, he keeps leaving his squadmates in the dark. Which is a little hypocritical, considering that the same is being done to him by his direct superiors. And lastly, if he has concerns, why would he not be sharing it with his team? Understandable if it is because he hasn't known them for so long, but I would also feel that way if I had a squadmate who refused to share his concerns, especially considering that he seems to know a lot more than we do. After Titus dismisses his squad members lashing out at him, we make our way to where the Neurothrope has set up shop. This becomes a boss fight, which I find a bit weird. We fought Neurothropes before, and they were way easier to kill. Before the purpose of the story and how devastating this particular one has been to the squad we met earlier, he's a lot more powerful. What I don't like about this is that every so often a new enemy is introduced as a boss, but then in the next mission gets severely downgraded in terms of its power and becomes quite trivial and not really something to be feared as opposed to preserving the feeling and memory of how difficult a boss was in having that one instance of fighting it, turning something that could have been iconic into not so. Hope that makes sense. Well, the boss is quite challenging, but we do end up defeating it and once we regroup with Varelis, we reach the dome. Upon reaching the dome, we come across a group of military men. We ask them a couple of questions, like if the dome has been infiltrated. The men respond positively that it has not happened, but that they had been ordered by their captain to stay there until further orders. Varelis orders them to go, leave as they're no longer needed, but they don't seem to be sure. So they try contacting their captain. When they do that, Chiron notices a marking on their skin, which looks a lot like the markings of Chaos. He warns us that it's an ambush, but before the man gets killed, he detonates a bomb that kills Varelis. Soon after, we're ambushed by a bunch of heretic Astartes who have turned to Chaos and betray the others. 
Now we're finally faced with a new group of enemies that are completely different. It's a welcome addition since the enemies were starting to feel a bit samey at this stage. They're not so difficult per se, but it's the new parry and dodge timings that we need to get used to, so I just kept being hit by their heavy attacks because I was so used to tyranny timings. Once we defeat the first group of heretics and move further, this event infuriates Chiron so much that he lashes out and storms the enemies without any form of backup. So for the next 15 minutes we're just backing him up and making sure he makes it out alive from this situation. Something you also come across is the altar of the Arch Enemy. It's a form of magic that blocks anyone from coming through a barrier created by it. By destroying it, the barrier is lifted and we're able to move further and closer to our objectives. We finally reach the place Marius is hiding in, but the heretics found him first. They're trying to breach his hideout while using their chaos magic, technology, wh whatever you want to call it. We make it down and have to stand within a radius from the altar that powers the weapon that is breaching the hideout. This is because something to do with us powers down the weapon itself. As we do so, we just have to resist several waves of enemies coming down to stop us. Once we finish powering it off, we finally are able to get Marius out. While we're returning with our squad and the newly saved Marius lose, Marius catches Titus' name over the radio communication he received. He claims that a Captain Titus was killed over a century ago in the planet Graia, while holding the very artifact they're looking to use. He seems to be astonished that a man like him is still alive after such an event since even an Astartes is not supposed to survive such power. Safe to say, this raises some eyebrows. When we get back, we report directly to Captain Acheron. In the meantime, Avarax has been overrun with Heretic Astartes, which has caused a great threat to us, and Lord Kalgar believes that the artifact weapon they have is the only way to recover from such a problem. Akron is aware of Titus's issue with this, but Titus also proceeds to request at least an attempt for us to make contact with Chapter Master Kalgar, to make him aware of the danger since we cannot establish long distance communication with him. Titus is able to narrow down where the Hive Tyrant is located, essentially, it's a creature that is able to control other Tyranids by having a Hive Mind system. If it's taken down, it makes the whole ordeal a whole lot easier. Titus gets six men from Acheron, a group to kill the Hive Tyrant, another to find whatever it is that is jamming the comms, and another to pass the message on to Chapter Master Kalgar. We're the ones responsible for passing the message on, and although it looks like the easiest one, trust me, it's not. Before we leave, the chaplain warns us to make sure we choose our words carefully for successful in establishing communication, as this is likely to have a major impact on the course of this war. At this stage, it's clear that Gadiel's doubts and feelings about Titus are starting to get even more intense than they already were, openly disagreeing and opposing Titus' opinion despite of holding a higher rank, also becoming more suspicious of him due to Titus' record displaying the fact that he had been accused of heresy a century ago. And although all remaining details had been redacted, Titus decides to share that his service for the Death Watch was a chosen penance for his apparent crimes. For the last time, we arrive in Avarax and we make our way towards our goal, in this case, we're a long way from our objective and in the meantime we have got a lot of enemies to kill. It's a mix of both heretics and tyranids, mostly tyranids, the good thing is that everyone is killing each other so at least everyone gets shit. We get to a point where our path is destroyed and a cutscene plays where we get a military drop of jetpacks. Gadriel gets bold enough to insinuate that Titus is working with the heretic traitors. He doesn't outright say it, but the whole squad gets the vibe. Before anything else is said, Gadriel decides to shoot off and then the rest follows. On a side note, this cutscene is... Amazing, but it makes me realize of one thing. This game allows you to do a whole lot of badass stuff, but it doesn't vary too much. Which is a shame in my opinion. How awesome would it have been to turn this cutscene into an actual fighting sequence where you kind of slide down these rooftops and use your jetpack while fighting enemies. Also, I got really excited when jetpack was firstly introduced and thought it would become a staple of the game and would be used in every mission. I was wrong. It's not, and you won't. Which makes me sad. The jetpack section is cool but very short-lived. We get to use it for around 10 minutes tops and then it's disabled completely. From a story standpoint, it seems like none of the squads at this stage have been successful in their objectives, which makes it harder for us as we get swarmed by a group of Tyranids including a lovely boss which is a reused Carnifex. I still enjoy the fight but would have appreciated a new boss. We defeat it but then three more show up, completely overwhelming us. But before we know it, one of the squads is able to kill the Hive Tyrant, which means that all other Tyranids either flee or die instantly. This now allows us to make it to the room where we're able to contact Chapter Master Kalgar. Although we're not received with a welcoming and open-armed reception, we insist on having an audience through a woman called Naoma. I have no idea what she is or what she does, but she seems to have the capability to pass on a message telepathically and we do just that. As that's supposed to happen, she begins to accuse Titus of being a heretic and a traitor. Gadriel promptly believes it and begins to threaten Titus. In the meantime, Chiron shoots the woman which reveals her to have been possessed by chaos used by the sorcerer Imra. 
all of a sudden we have a two-part boss fight. First, we're to attack Imura, as he flies across the stage while trying to dodge both his projectile attacks and some slow-moving chaos skulls that explode when they get too near. The first part is easy, the second one becomes slightly harder as it's a lot more based on dodging, parrying and melee attacking. I really enjoyed this boss fight, it added a bit of spazzazz that the game needed at this point as enemy variety is starting to become tiring. After defeating the boss, we get a message from the Akaran. We're to get back to the battle base as Chaos forces are attempting to take possession of the Aurora weapon, which means we're leaving to a new planet, the Miriam, as soon as possible. Before we depart for the Miriam, the chaplain requests an audience. He's worried about the accusation of heresy by the Astra Telepathica, which is the lady we killed. He uses Gadriel's attack to further fuel his doubts about Titus, which Gadriel promptly replies by saying that he was wrong and that the lady was possessed by our enemy, the sorcerer Aimura. Although no repercussions occur, he's still doubtful and will be watching us, and if he suspects any level of corruption, if chaos involved, he will not hesitate in taking any action he deems necessary. We then promptly proceed to our gunship before launching an all-out assault in Demirium. The mission's overall goal is to stop the activation of the Project Aurora weapon, since, as I've mentioned before, it could have disastrous effects. On a side note, this is an absolute behemoth of a mission spending two hours long. A lot of it is just fighting, which is very much appreciated, but every now and again are significant developments in the actual plot and the relationship between the characters. I'll be skipping most of the fighting and commentating on the more significant parts of the mission, because there's only so much describing I can do when it comes to the actual fighting. For the first part of the mission, we have one of the coolest sections of the game. We jump out of our ship and fly directly to the planet while dodging all sorts of space debris in our way. I like this because finally, besides the jetpack being introduced as a new mechanic, this is the first time that we do something in the game that is anything besides fighting. Which is not bad, but even though it may be an unfair comparison, Final Fantasy XVI greatly capitalized on trying to achieve what is thought to be the impossible, which is the fact that you don't really watch cutscenes, the gameplay becomes the cutscenes. This allows our character to do some of the craziest things that we never thought possible, while maintaining the gameplay fresh and most of all, an unforgettable experience. But moving on. As soon as we arrive, the heretic welcoming committee gathers as they welcome us with loaded guns. How nice. Our first goal is to establish a beacon that will allow one of our old ships that was wrecked while fighting in the Miriam to collapse with a structure that seems to be where enemies draw their energy and power from. While we're waiting for the battle barge to collapse with the energy source, we're to protect the beacon from enemies to make sure that things go according to plan, which it does. Now we're to advance towards the Mechanicus facility where Luz is in and to try and stop Aurora from getting activated. As we move towards it, Imura gets in our heads, trying to turn us against each other, trying to corrupt our minds and even suggesting the possibility of joining him. We arrive at the facility, but we have to make our way down it. As it appears it was an old dig site used to investigate and study chaos. Little did we know that search for knowledge could have such negative consequences. Until the next major event, mostly what happens is fighting, so we're gonna fast forward a bit. We find Luz, and he seems to be protected by some sort of force field. He's still convinced that this weapon will somehow help us, and that the danger is actually unfounded. Also, since this is his life work, his ego probably doesn't want to admit that this is actually a mistake. The prospect of seizing this huge of a project is too much of a negative prospect for him to even considering that. Imura shows up and tries to attack Luz, but it seems like even his magic is insufficient against whatever it is that the force field is made of. Once Titus and co. attack Imura, he summons a hell brute and now we have a boss fight on our hands. This boss fight is not only challenging, but is cool as hell. It's great seeing that the developers actually saved some novelty towards the end of the game. Don't keep launching us the same enemies over and over again like it's been done so much previously. But the best part is when you defeat the hell brute. The execution animation is so good, and even a bit funny, just look at the way Titus drops his head as if it's nothing. This is the end for you, wretched thing. What happens then is a major plot twist. Luz manages to activate the Aurora weapon by turning some sort of artifact, and according to him, this should make any Chaos Being's existence to stop. We believe this until Imura reveals that he had been corrupting Luz this whole time, making him believe that that's what's supposed to happen, when in reality, it just makes Chaos Being stronger. Imura proceeds to destroy the facility, and we make our way to the surface. When we make it to the surface, all soldiers seem to be having visions of being somehow possessed by the chaos magic causing all sorts of delusions and strange behavior. Soon enough, we reunite with Akaran and talk next steps. We're to attempt to walk through the portal that the heretics are using to get to us and destroy the artifacts that are powering the huge beacon in the distance. We arrive at a tiny hill and hold our banner as we kill the seemingly never-ending waves of heretics, and then 
a cutscene place. This is possibly one of the coolest entrances I've seen in a game. All of a sudden, Lord Kalgar joins the fight, kills all enemies in his path without a drop of sweat and no hint of any bother. And he delivers the line. Lifter, I received your message. Brief me. Badass. As we are briefing Lord Kalgar, Gadriel has a plan. The obelisks we see in the distance have the same shape as the artifact used by Luz to activate the aurora. The idea is that if we find a way to invert it the same way that Luz did, we should be able to deactivate the aurora and hopefully live to fight another day. We charge the battlefield alongside Lord Kalgar as he finishes delivering a speech to the Ultramarines. The coolest thing happens. A huge creature drops into the battlefield and attacks us as we charge the enemy's army. Soon after, we reach the control unit, but Titus doesn't understand how it works. On a whim, Gadriel attempts to invert a miniature version of the obelisk that is exuding all sorts of chaos energy. It's painful and difficult to do so, but he is successful. As the obelisk turns, it glows green and shoots a ray in the direction of the main pillar and very visibly hurts the enormous creature that jumped into the battlefield earlier. Now there's three remaining obelisks that need to be inverted. We're to deactivate one more, while other two squads deactivate the remaining ones. We fight through loads more enemies and join forces with a dreadnought as he clears the path for us in order to reach the final obelisk. Chiron turns the one in a cutscene place once more. As a last attack, the enormous looking bird uses a power that seems to hold everyone in the battlefield completely still, as if it had stopped time. We remain unaffected since we found shelter and Lord Kalgar charges what seems to be some sort of spatial rift. We take the opportunity to run after him and we find ourselves in what is called the Immaterium, which is a place beyond time and space. As we navigate this place, we get to a point where we find Imura, but no Kalgar. Kalgar seems to be stuck in a completely different dimension. Soon after, the final boss battle of the game begins. The attacks used by Imura are quite similar to before, with some differences. The main one being the fact that he invokes that big ass bird we saw earlier into this battle. It's dope though, this boss fight excels at what it did and was completely worth the wait. The battle swaps from fighting Imura and fighting the bird, which is a nice change of pace. As a last effort, Imura seemingly blinds us and we're transported into a completely new and dark dimension. Titus tries to make sense of this place and as we walk through it we find Lord Kalgar, but as seen before, Chaos can create illusions so he is suspicious of us and asks us to say the words he said to Titus a long time ago, which we promptly reply with. Now he knows we're real. From this point on, we help each other and charge towards the only source of light in this dark dimension where it can be the only place left where Imura might be at. We dodge attacks all the way through, and as we get closer, another cutscene plays. Imura invokes the bird as a last effort to kill us, but while the rest of our squad and Kalgar distract it and attack it, Titus makes a run for Imura, which is right above the final obelisk. We run into the light, which seems to cause excruciating pain, but he finds the strength within him to move forward despite it. He turns the obelisk and everything fades to black. We wake up and we're surrounded by our brethren. We rise with the help of our mates and we cheer for the Emperor. The mission was a success. The game ends with Titus being presented with the laurels of victory by Lord Kalgar. This is one if not the highest honor someone can be presented with by the Imperial Wizards. It is said that the mere sight of the symbol makes most enemies run for their lives. Lord Kalgar then apologizes for what had happened to Titus due to his past accusations of being involved in any form of heresy. He has no doubt of our devotion. Lastly, he announces that there is a mission required of him, which will take him away from the second company for a time. Akron and our squad mates say our farewells, and lastly we speak with a chaplain, who will be joining us in this mission. Even after all of this, he still suspects our devotion, almost as if he has a personal vendetta against us. Soon after, he reveals his identity. Leandros. This is a significant moment because Leandros is the one responsible for accusing Titus in the first Space Marine game as a heretic, meaning that everything that happened to Titus afterward was his doing. The game then ends on that note, which is a very good one at that. As a last reflection, do I think this will be game of the year? No, but that's not a bad thing. Warhammer is a massive step, if not a leap, in the right direction for me. It's a game that, first and foremost, is fun. It respects the IP, which is beloved by many and has not become tainted by the stain of monetization and money milking, like the Star Wars franchise as an example. It's a game with a plot, but its main selling point is the gameplay, but that doesn't detract the developers and writers from making the story a worthwhile investment, since there is a certain level of depth to it. One of my favorite examples is Gadriel as a character. We see him develop from initial respect and perceiving Titus as a role model, 
but with the unfolding of events in the story, his devotion and respect turn into suspicion and distaste for Titus due to his failings as a leader and seemingly withholding a lot of information from his squadmates, which struck as distrust. Funnily enough, what happened between Titus and Leandros in the past was repeating itself, which even Titus recognizes at some point. My main point is that there is something for everyone in this game. Whether you're a massive Warhammer fan, you're into the multiplayer, the co-op, everything. I believe that whoever you might be, there's some form of entertainment to draw from this experience, which I highly recommend. I'd rate this game a solid 8.5 out of 10. I kinda just wish it was longer. More enemy variety, and that's that, really. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you're a super fan of Warhammer, I hope I made this franchise justice. But I'll see you in the next video.